very excited to be in Australia for the first time in my life. Um, uh, uh, just two drawbacks. One of them is uh, the jet lag, so if I start talking gibberish in the, in the middle of this, that's, that's why. And, and the second is, is sort of getting my head around how, how come a, a, a country that has become so successful as a country of immigration and asylum should now have such a complex about refugees uh, and asylum seekers. Um, but uh, that's, I guess, one of the topics of our conversation today. I'll be talking about uh, our experience in Europe on that, particularly in the light of the crises uh, that are unfolding in the Middle East. Um, let me start by saying what I think Human Rights Watch is contribution to the refugees field is, and I think it's twofold. On the one hand, um, we have a very small refugees program, uh, which consists of two people, and I think their job is to sort of scan the horizon for the new emerging refugee issues, uh, and then do research on those issues and uh, advocate on those. And our recent publications are on uh, uh, from the refugees division, I think, give you an idea of you know how that works. So we've done uh, just in, in the in the last year, we did a report on uh, sub-Saharan migrants and asylum seekers in Morocco. Um, we did a report on the trafficking and torture of Eritrean refugees in Egypt. Uh, we did a report also last year on Bulgaria's uh, pushbacks and detention of Syria, Syrian and, and, and other asylum seekers. Uh, and we did a report on Jordan's treatment of Palestinians escaping from, from Syria, and a report on Israel's coercion of Eritrean and Sudanese asylum seekers to, uh, to leave Israel. Uh, and that's a pretty impressive list of reports for a two-man team in the Refugees Division. And that is, you know, that's, that's our first contribution. The second contribution of, of Human Rights Watch to the refugees field is, is this. Uh, because of our broad geographical scope, and we do try to cover you know, all the countries of concern uh, where human rights abuses are taking place around the world. We work, as, as Jane said, in 90 countries. We are, I think, the go-to resource for practitioners in the field of refugee protection. That is to say, the UNHCR folks, uh, immigration officials, um, caseworkers and, and lawyers and judges uh, on immigration tribunals. Uh, and just sort of as an anecdote, since I've been uh, in, in Australia just a, a few days, I've already heard from several people who work in the refugees field how useful uh, our, our work is uh, to them on a day-to-day day -day basis. And, and I've even seen our report sort of in the background in offices where I've uh, had meetings uh, with these people uh, to, 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 to prove it. I think that's, uh, so those are the two um, the two uh, areas where Human Rights Watch, I think, makes a, a, a valuable uh, contribution uh, in the field of, of, of refugees. Now, what is the problem here? I mean, we're, we're at a crisis point, I think, uh, when it comes to refugees. Uh, it's not controversial to talk about a, a, a global refugee crisis, and nor is it particularly controversial or complicated to state broadly what this, what this crisis is. Um, the number of people fleeing wars and, and persecution and, and poverty and repression has never been greater uh, in recent decades. UNHCR's uh, count of so-called people of concern um, has topped 50 million for the first time since uh, the UN Refugee Agency was established. But at the same time, nearly all the countries in the world today faced with influxes of refugees and asylum seekers and migrants are feeling immense pressures to close their borders or otherwise block access to asylum, uh, and very little countervailing pressure to provide protection to those who need it. Uh, that, I think, is the central problem that we face. And the reasons uh, for this are uh, uh, for this uh, pressure to block uh, asylum seekers and, and migrants, I think are, uh, there are a few common themes here. There are concerns about a political backlash, certainly in Europe, the rise of, of right-wing parties on, on anti-immigration platforms is, is a key issue. There are concerns with uh, Islamophobia and the, uh, the economic crisis. 
uh, in Europe, uh, some sections of the media promoting the absurd view that uh, the influx of refugees and, and, and migrants will Islamicize the West, um, uh, and the maybe slightly less absurd view that uh, they could be a fertile ground for terrorist recruitment, but still widely, uh, wildly exaggerated. Uh, the idea that refugees will be a burden on the welfare state, on housing, on health, uh, education, and so forth, that's a, a, common, a common view. Also, the view that inter integration, whether it's been attempted through the model of assimilation or through the model of multiculturalism, uh, is failing in Europe, um, uh, and that there's uh, no capacity to absorb more, more migrants and asylum seekers without uh, provoking uh, a social crisis. So, in the light of those uh, swirling issues, the debate has become highly toxic, politicized, and is, is open to manipulation. Now, a word about the definition. Um, it's doubtful that even the 50 million figure that UNHCR um, mentions uh, as uh, people uh, of concern requiring protection encompasses all the forced migrants uh, that ought to be of concern uh, to an organization like Human Rights Watch. Those who might not be included in UNHCR's count, uh, but for whom our mandate of Human Rights Watch might apply, include people who leave or can't return to their places of origin because of extreme poverty, um, ecological devastation, including climate change, environmental disasters, pollution, deforestation, etc. Rampant organized uh, criminality, so gang violence in, uh, in, in Central America and, and Colombia, uh, as well as the associated threats of extortion, kidnapping, and so forth. Um, generalized indiscriminate violence in places like Somalia and Libya. Uh, Broad-based discrimination and, and uh, domestic abuse against women, against children, uh, against people with disabilities, the elderly, LGBT people among others, in which uh, the state actors are not directly um, implicated, um, and in which the perpetrators have the private reasons for abusing people, but are unable to do so uh, because their victims are marginalized in their societies. And people who don't qualify as refugees because of their own cr criminal conduct. Um, so uh, the mix of elements that cause migration also includes uh, voluntary factors like seeking economic and educational opportunities, uh, greater social freedom uh, and family reunification, among others, which may factor into our assessment as Human Rights Watch uh, of uh, rights to human dignity and choice, or if not rights, relevant humanitarian concerns. So determining who among the world's migrants has a right to be protected from enforced returns is more challenging than it ever has been. Um, uh, and, and of course, because of the fortress mentality uh, that has uh, built up in Europe, Australia, and the US, the receiving countries are adopting ever narrower definitions of uh, who qualifies for protection, leaving more and more people, obviously, unprotected. So I want to talk a bit about some of the common approaches to migration control um, in, in Europe, and, you'll, and then I'll talk a little bit about some make some comparative comments about uh, you know, Europe and, and Australia. Um, I mentioned that our refugees division work is sort of focus on the key emerging refugee policy issues, dilemmas and, and problems, and underlining where states refugee policies are, failing, are falling short. And I want to spend a bit of time talking about um, this current approach to my, the current approaches to migration control, uh, including, you know, I, I think that the, the common theme here is, is exclusion, right? Um, so the most uh, concrete control mechanisms are uh, physical barriers. Uh, and the problem with physical barriers is that they're indiscriminate. You don't know who you're keeping out, uh, who needs protection. Uh, the principle of uh, uh, non refoulement includes rejection at frontiers um, if this would result in threats to uh, life or freedom. Nonetheless, in spite of that, physical barriers are increasingly part of the, of the toolkit in Europe, and we've seen that in uh, 
in uh, Bulgaria, which built a, a new fence uh, on its border with Turkey, which also happens to be the EU's outer border in late 2013, early 2014, which uh, resulted in the fact that Bulgaria was the only EU country to record a drop in uh, um, Syrian asylum seekers in 2014. Uh, Spain has elaborate uh, and, uh, for some people who try to scale them, fatal uh, fences uh, at the borders uh, of Ceuta and Melilla, uh, its two enclaves in, uh, in, in Morocco on the North African coast, uh, which keep out migrants without assessing needs for protection um, uh, and uh, return them often to abusive treatment in Morocco, which until recently was simply uh, collecting up uh, asylum seekers and, and, and migrants and dumping them on the border with Algeria in the middle of the desert. Uh, so another, another key tool uh, in, the, in the toolbox is the detention of asylum seekers. Um, and in our report on, on Bulgaria that I, I mentioned, which is called Containment Plan, Human Rights Watch reported on uh, an immigration camp called the, the Harmanli Camp. Uh, which was effectively a closed facility. Re refugees could not come or go. Um, and to all intents and purposes, it was a de detention center, and conditions were horrible. Um, since our report was published, things have improved a, a, a little bit, um, but uh, it's still problematic. Uh, we also documented uh, the situation in our report on Israel at the Holot uh, res Residency Safe uh, Desert. Uh, Israel's High Court ruled three times that those held at Holot are in detention and that asylum seekers should be released. But each time, uh, the executive comes up with another way to maintain uh, detention, but call it something else. Um, uh, essentially, as our report on this uh, detention center showed um, last year, um, Israel essentially presents those who are held there uh, with uh, a so-called choice between prolonged indefinite detention and departure to a third country. Uh, accompanying detention, there's a tendency to make sure that the asylum procedures uh, are, are as slow and dysfunctional uh, as possible, and to a, a, adopt the narrowest possible interpretation of qualification for refugee status, and wherever possible to ensure um, swift returns of, of migrants and would-be asylum seekers to their countries of origin. Now, despite a common EU asylum system, there is a, a, quite a wide disparity in asylum procedures um, and reception conditions in the European Union. It's no surprise that Italy and Greece, uh, two of the main countries of entry into the EU, have relatively low per capita applications. Uh, Greece has made strides to fix its dysfunctional asylum system, but access remains uh, extremely uh, limited. Um, uh, and problematic, and recognition rates are among the lowest uh, in, in the EU. Uh, asylum seekers are then left to their own uh, devices uh, without support and face xenophobic, xenophobic uh, violence on the streets um, of, of Athens and other cities. Uh, Italy has high recognition rates, but uh, inadequate reception facilities and, poor, and a poor integration program. Uh, and Bulgaria's uh, asylum system was completely dysfunctional in 2013 when we did our research with backlogs and, and uh, poor interpretation, uh, translation, um, cursory interviews, uh, no appeals, uh, and inad totally inadequate reception conditions for asylum seekers while their claims were, were pending. Uh, although the system did improve quite remarkably after our report was published. The other sort of element of this picture of exclusion um, that uh, the Europeans are presenting towards uh, in response to the influx of, of, of refugees is the externalization, externalization of, of migration controls uh, with a view to restricting entry as far as possible, obviously. So an example of, of this is that in 2005, uh, Spain more or less closed down the migration route between Senegal and Mauritania and the Canary Islands, which is way out in the Atlantic, a long way south of Spain and, and closer to the African coast, by providing West African states with the wherewithal, patrol boats and so forth, uh, uh, to, uh, to interdict that, uh, the, that, uh, that route. Um, uh, 
and uh, the European Union's uh, border, Patrol, border Control Agency, Frontex, um, lists this as a huge success. Um, and it would be the preferred model in the central Mediterranean uh, if uh, willing partners could be found uh, to implement it. Um, there's also, of course, the, the safe third country uh, concept. Uh, so that would be to tell the asylum seeker, you know, there was a, a country that you passed through before coming here where you could have sought asylum and where it's safe for you to return. And so Bulgaria says you can go back to Turkey uh, and therefore pushbacks are not um, uh, Spain says Morocco is safe, so pushing back asylum seekers from Morocco at the Ceuta and Melilla border, where they have these huge electronic, electric fences, is okay, even though Morocco has this history that I mentioned of dumping asylum seekers in the desert um, on the border with Algeria. Um, Israel, in fact, takes this concept a step further by sending Sudanese and Eritreans to Uganda, even though they never transited that country uh, and have no connection to it whatsoever. Uh, another idea popular among European migration policymakers is the internal flight alternative, uh, IFA for short. Uh, so that's where you tell the refugee or asylum seeker that, uh, yes, you are indeed a refugee insofar as you have a well-founded fear of persecution in your country of origin, um, but uh, there's one part of your country where it is safe for you to go uh, back um, and where you can find safety. So we can deny you asylum and send you there uh, to become, obviously, therefore, an entirely displaced uh, person. So some countries, um, including Sweden, are... Exploring the idea, uh, well, we don't actually know whether they've done it or not because they're not being transparent about it, but exploring the idea, certainly, of returning Iraqi asylum seekers saying that they can have an alternative flight, an internal flight alternative in northern Iraq. Um, and our most, but our most recent research in the uh, Kurdish um, region of Iraq suggests uh, that uh, Sunni Arabs uh, are not... Uh, treated uh, well enough uh, in uh, the KRI, in the Kurdish region of Iraq, for this proposition to be valid. Uh, Norway, under the same principle, has uh, tried to return Afghans uh, to Kabul, saying Kabul is safe, even though maybe the areas that they uh, originated from in Afghanistan are not. And uh, Europe has also been anxious to explore the idea of the internal flight uh, alternative in, in uh, Somalia, uh, one of the most unstable countries in the world. But this has now obviously been thrown into disarray by the latest appalling terrorist attack in uh, the University of, of Garissa in, uh, in Kenya, in northeastern Kenya, after which Nairobi uh, has ordered the closure of the massive uh, Dada uh, refugee camp and the removal of the camp's 350,000 uh, refugees to Somalia. And then, of course, there's the whole issue of externalizing the processing of refugee uh, claims. Uh, the European Union plans to um, process, well, it hopes to process refugee uh, claims in North Africa, but the, the plan uh, is only being presented so far in, in bare outline although it's, been, it's, been, it's gained, gained added momentum uh, as a result of the uh, most recent tragedy uh, and deaths at sea in the Mediterranean. Uh, but the idea, in fact, has been floating around for quite a long time. Uh, our pre preliminary analysis of it is that uh, it's fairly, fairly problematic. Um, I won't go into the details here, but perhaps we can talk about that a bit uh, in, uh, in, in question and answer. In, in answer. But, I'm sure it will be familiar from your experience uh, with, um, uh, with Australia. So let me just uh, give a, make a few po brief points about uh, uh, comparative, you know, comparative points, comparative comments between Europe and Australia. I mean, the first point I would make is that the European context at present does not permit an Australian-style solution, however much European leaders uh, might want one. Uh, and however much uh, your Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, would recommend that Europe attempt one. Uh, the Mediterranean is too small, uh, the land borders are too long and too porous, um, and 
quite apart from that, the European Convention on Human Rights would make the Australian approach uh, illegal. Uh, the second point is that the crises that are prompting many of these flows are much closer geographically to Europe and to European states. Um, and, uh, and, and European states themselves are much more closely involved politically and militarily in those crises. So uh, the stakes are really very high. Um, the, the, the pressure on Europe to get even more involved in efforts to resolve these crises, uh, simply as a refugee management, uh, is, uh, on, on refugee management uh, grounds, is, is really great. And yet Europe doesn't have an effective strategy to deal with these crises. So, and that's partly because of the legacy of Iraq and the failure of the whole approach to, to, to terrorism over the last 15 years. Um, I think also that the internal situation in Europe is obviously very different than it, to the one it, that, it, that exists in, in, in Australia. Instead of one state, you have 27 members of the European Union, European Union plus Switzerland, Norway, um, you have gaping differences uh, of approach in, uh, on how to, to handle uh, the, the crisis between different states and, and no effective common uh, decision-making processes on when it comes to this issue um, because migration policy is a, a national issue in, 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 uh, the, uh, in the European Union. Um, in, in some countries, the problems of, of integration, uh, whether they've cho chosen the assimilation root or multiculturalism are really much more serious as well in, in Europe, I think, than, uh, than they are in Australia. Um, I think even though, uh, you know, I would certainly question uh, the, uh, a lot of the rhetoric around the debate on um, uh, asylum in, in, in Europe, the, the terms of the debate, I think nonetheless it's true to say that Europe, European countries are more crowded um, They've had a longer experience with, uh, with, with uh, immigration and, uh, and, 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 and refugees, and uh, I think that the, uh, the pressures are more real than they are in, in Australia. In terms of common ground, uh, both Europe and Australia are, faced, are using similar strategies, obviously, to sell these restrictive policies to their, to their publics. For example, the humanitarian fig leaf. Um, Governments present control measures as humanitarian, that is, to save lives at sea by preventing people from going to sea on, on rickety boats in the first place. But the fact of the matter is that the right to leave is a basic human right, recognized in the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and uh, the ICCPR. If you think back to the Cold War, the Berlin Wall, which was built to prevent people from leaving, and if you think about how the West protested throughout the Cold War about uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Berlin Wall and the, the way it prevented people leaving uh, Eastern Europe, uh, those same Western countries today are constructing their own physical barriers um, uh, and legal sort of Berlin Walls, if you like, to keep people out. Uh, and they're both Europe and uh, Australia are also using the anti-smuggling, anti-trafficking uh, fight criminality argument. Um, and the problem with this is that while smugglers and traffickers are exploitative and are often cruel in their treatment uh, of migration, migrants and asylum seekers, when you block legal paths, uh, desperate people have really no choice but to use smugglers. Um, and uh, you know, we agree with states on the need to prevent traffickers from abusing human rights by using force and, and, and threats to exploit migrants. But smuggling per se, while a violation of the sovereign rights of states um, to control entry through their borders, does not violate the human rights of migrants who enter into voluntary agreements with them. So prevention of smuggling is a legitimate law enforcement objective, but it's not preventing a human rights violation. Um, so finally, um, solutions. Uh, you know, I don't want to pretend that there are easy solutions to the global refugee crisis, um, which only looks set to get worse in coming years. Um, and I think it would be a mistake strategically to suggest that there were easy solutions. 
And I think that the standard short response of, of human rights organizations, including my own, Human Rights Watch, to the question what needs to be done to tackle the crisis in the Mediterranean, um, uh, which is, you know, ramp up search and rescue, better sharing of responsibilities for protecting people fleeing war and persecution in their home countries, and the creation of safe legal channels for asylum seekers and migrants to come. I think that that response is fine, but it's much easier said than done, and we shouldn't underestimate the difficulties in actually putting that into effect, uh, which would require massive political will uh, across regions and countries to overcome you know, the obstacles uh, that are I've alluded to uh, at the beginning. So I'd like to conclude with just three points. First of all, you know, the source of refugees, when it comes to the source of refugees, politicians in the West often speak about the need to staunch you know, these crises which are generating these flows, and clearly that's a good idea. Um, what they don't acknowledge is that in many of these crises, the West itself is part of the problem. Uh, the strategy of the West, for example, in the Middle East in recent years has been a destabilizing strategy. Uh, far from being effective in resolving crises, Western interventions have exacerbated them, in great part by ignoring rights and forging alliances with some of the most abusive players in the region, like Saudi Arabia. Nor is it clear that the West has learned many lessons at all from the errors of the war on terror the very evident errors from the war on terror over the past decade and a half. So Iraq is obviously the key example of failure. Uh, one could also argue that there have been serious uh, and avoidable missteps in Syria and in, Li in Libya. And right now, the US and Europe are backing a Saudi-led military operation in Yemen, which is almost certain to create another major refugee crisis if it, if it is to continue. So, there's little hope of limiting the flows of refugees unless Western countries up their game in resolving the crises of the Middle East, or Africa for that matter, or at the very least desist from exacerbating them. That's the first concluding point. The second one is that we really need to be very clear not only about the sources of refugee flows, but also about the consequences in the regions most in heavily impacted, and the ultimate costs not just to those regions of those refugee flows, but to Europe. You could do a proper cost-benefit analysis of any proposed action. Most of the three million refugees, for example, from Syria are in Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey. Those numbers are quite simply unsustainable. The impacts on those countries and on the region as a whole are already visible. It could very well, they could very well provoke more crises, which will in turn create more refugees, putting even more pressure on Europe. Likewise, we're seeing the impact of the Somali refugee crisis in, in Kenya in the same sort of way. So there's a need to look ahead and consider the cost of not acting, right, to relieve the dire situation of refugees in the regions where the crises are emerging. And there's a need to work with those poorer and less resilient countries like Jordan and Lebanon uh, on how to share the burden of refugees' protection. And finally, in order to get to the starting block of creating safe legal channels for asylum seekers and migrants, there's a need to overcome the vast political obstacles that exist in, the, in Europe, as in uh, Australia. And to achieve this, to achieve this last aim, there needs to be a serious and properly informed debate within Europe, within Australia, within North America, about the nature of what is now a global refugee crisis, about its causes and about its likely consequences, and its costs to our own societies if it is not managed well, and also the potential benefits of migration if it is managed well. Uh, and that's why it's so important to have centers like this one that are, I think, at the core of triggering this debate that needs to take place. So, 
Thank you for the work you do here. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tom, um, for that really fascinating global perspective that you've given us and also for the meeting endorsement of the centre. Um, we've now got time for some questions, so uh, if anyone has a question, please leave it. Thanks, Tom. So you mentioned uh, the suggestions in Europe about starting to process claims in North Africa and there may be some, some problems in human rights watch to identify. Would you be able to speak to some of those issues? Uh, yes, I could. Um, look, I mean, just to start with, if you think about some of the countries that they're thinking about using as partners, I mean, first of all, we haven't agreed, um, but even if they did, Egypt. Uh, Egypt is a country which saw, um, two years ago, the worst massacre of civilians uh, in, um, in modern history, in one day. Um, and, uh, you know, there remain, you know, extraordinary human rights problems. So the idea of partnering with Egypt on, you know, external processing of asylum claims seems pretty um, far-fetched to me, even if Egypt agreed. Um, secondly, uh, Tunisia is another one. Tunisia is the, the one sort of bright spot, if you like, from uh, the Arab Spring, the last man standing, you know. And it's going through an incredibly fragile... Uh, transition, um, and uh, the last thing it needs, frankly, is to be burdened with with, with something like this. Um, but then there's sort of the question about there are all sorts of questions, and very similar to the questions that uh, Australia is, is facing with with Nauru and, and, and Manus Island about um, you know what happens to these uh, people once they are. Um, uh, I mean, how, how, effect, how, how transparent will the, uh, the process be? Um, and, uh, and what will happen to them if they are denied asylum? You know, are they just going to wash around in you know, no man's land? Uh, there, there, are, there are, I think, a lot of uh, really difficult questions that uh, we need to um, kind of consider before um, going down the route of... Uh, processing uh, asylum seekers in, uh, in, in, in places like that. And some of the other countries that are considered are Sudan, Niger, Mali. Um, Sudan, a country whose president is uh, wanted by the International Criminal Court. It does seem rather far-fetched. <laughs> Um, thanks for this talk. It was very interesting. And um, I mean, while I was listening to it, you you were addressing um, the situation in Europe, almost as in kind of a general one. And I was thinking also about the different realities that there are within Europe in terms of um, refugee protection and the arrival of asylum seekers. So. Um, Italy is one of the most affected countries, if affected is the right word, by this um, influx of really high uh, volume of people arriving by boat. And I feel that um, the, this issue of uh, this huge number of people arriving to Italy by boat every day kind of goes dormant all the time until tragedy, tragedy strikes and that everyone starts talking about it again, including other countries within the European Union. And then it goes dormant again. It's kind of a cycle. And when tragedy strikes, uh, everyone starts saying that they want to do something about it to help this uh, problem in the Mediterranean. But in the end of the day, what the influx always remains within the reality of Italy or Greece, for example. So what are your suggestions in terms of addressing this more short-term kind of situation, that it is viable both in terms of human rights but also in terms of resources and everything else because, um, I mean, it's true that it is, there is a European Union but in terms of addressing this issue, Italy and other few countries are left by themselves. Yeah, no, I mean, that's absolutely true. I mean, I did 
try to refer to that a little bit, um, just, but just to expand, you know, I mean, Italy, Greece, Spain, they're three of the countries that are most affected by the economic crisis. They're also the countries that are most impacted by these flows of, of, of refugees. And because of the Dublin regulation, right, um, if, a, if a refugee lands in Italy, goes up the boot of Italy and into, you know, wealthier northern Europe, that, that Germany, for example, or France. France can say, well, according to the Dublin Dub Re regulation, we can legitimately send you back to, uh, to Italy to apply for asylum there. So it does put an extraordinary burden on these countries that can really ill afford it at the moment. And that's one of the issues that really needs to be sorted out. I mean, that's where we, it's why we need to have, you know, a, a sort of a proper regional discussion in Europe, uh, preferably part of a, a global discussion about the crisis, because it is a global crisis, but a proper regional discussion in Europe about how to fix this problem. And, you know, the, 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 the one thing that is stopping that from happening is this toxic debate in each of these individual countries where the politicians are, are competing on a national basis, they're not competing on, on a regional basis, so they're talking to their own voters, and they're determined you know, to avoid accepting any greater responsibility than the, the one that they already have for refugees. And so there's no way that they're going to agree to end the Dublin regulation, for example, and accept, and accept a more equitable burden-sharing arrangement. But this is what has to happen, right? Uh, and so that's why, in order to get there, we need to have the debate in our, in our, in our societies. In, in Australia, there needs to be a debate, obviously. In, 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 in the UK, in my country, there needs to be a debate. And then that needs to be taken to the regional level as well. We need to kind of, and, and we need to challenge all the sort of somewhat absurd, many of them are somewhat absurd, some of them are based in reality, but many of the somewhat absurd allegations that are taken as fact about the impact of refugees on, our, our, on, on society. And to also point out how what a positive um, contribution refugees can, can make, and that it needn't be a, a sort of lose-lose situation. So, yeah, that's, that's what needs to happen. Nothing can happen unless we change the terms of the debate, unless we detoxify the debate as it currently is being discussed. We have a question here, yes. and we'll take tomorrow. Do you have any sort of recommendation on, I suppose, what kind of platform that national or regional discussion needs to be had? Um, because I feel as though in Australia there's particularly quite a, a gridlock when people who are informed, who are factual and, and have done the research into the effects of, for example, Australia's current offshore processing centres. Professor Gillian Trigg was here before. Um, she was shot down for a very factual and very much evidence-based report on the mental health um, repercussions on children who have been um, incarcerated, essentially, in, in detention centres. Um, and that whole debate was just around, um, I suppose, targeting her and her personality rather than actually having an informed, constructive debate. And I feel as though that report really just, the impact of it was, was hugely diminished. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that political monopoly on what should be a very factual discussion is very difficult to avoid. May we just take sure. a second question, yeah. then, just because of time? Yes, of course. That's a little bit related, too. I, just, I found your analysis and examples very interesting, but pretty bleak. Um, and I think coming to this question of um, regional cooperation or um, inter, at least interstate cooperation. Along with the examples that you've given us, are there any current examples of this working well? Is there anywhere that we can look to where more than one state has come together, either in the region where a crisis is taking place or in response to one of these crises um, and done something constructive? Are there examples that we can point to to say there's something to learn from? Um, no. <laughs> uh, sadly. Um, but I mean, on, on your question, um, I think, uh, just sort of throwing out an idea here, but I think one of the problems is that, you know, those in the sort of human rights field, uh, in the legal field, who are kind of on the right side, um, <laughs> just to be completely objective, um, uh, 
we need to broaden it out. We need to bring more people in. We need to bring different disciplines in. We need to bring in doctors. Um, we need to bring in sports people. We need to bring in um, people from the broader society, right? Uh, and we also need and in, in, into the discussion, right? Because if it's just between between us, sort of legal experts, practitioners, lawyers, um, human rights activists and, on the one hand, and the politicians and their supporters in the media on the other, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to go anywhere, I don't think. Uh, so we need to, first of all, we need to broaden it out. The aim has to be, in the end, to convince the political leadership of the necessity that, it, that it's in their interests, in the end, to uh, take a different approach. Because this approach is going to lead to disaster. And I think that's the argument that we need to make. That has to be the end. Of, the end. But in the meantime, I think the first step is to broaden it out and to bring in you know, wider society, representatives of, of different professions to talk about this and to bring their own experience to bear. The people from the business community who can explain you know, how uh, immigration is a net game, usually, you know, historically. Um, so I think, I think that's what, what we need to do. But Ultimately, you know, I think the, the argument has to be, you, know, you, you need to do a, a thorough cost-benefit analysis because actually, the, certainly in the European context, I don't know about the Australian context because as I, as I pointed out, it's rather different, but in the European context where these crises are very close to Europe, right, and where already you know, the sort of linkages between Europe and these crises are, 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 are coming up and... and, and uh, and, and where also it's clear that you know, Europe has, is deeply involved in these conflicts in different ways, right? Uh, in that context, I think it's absolutely essential to argue that if we continue along this path, we're actually just building up a bigger problem in the future. Because the whole of that region where all these refugees are being, if they're blocked, they're not going to go back home. They're going to... They're going to swirl around in North Africa and Egypt. They're going to destabilize those, those countries. Lebanon has already, I mean, the, the first civil war in Lebanon was fought, uh, was triggered by Palestinian refugees. That was one of the key causes of that, of that uh, conflict. The, 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 the civil war went on for years and years. And I think Lebanon could be on the, on the brink of something similar. Jordan, it's quite possible, could be destabilized by these numbers. So, and Europe has to understand that if that happens, that will affect Europe as well, affect European interests. So, one needs to make that very kind of cold argument about you know, the cost-benefit and, and the, uh, the opportunity cost of not uh, addressing this problem in a sort of, uh, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a long-term effective way. In a way, oh sorry, I was going to say, in a way I feel like Australia is a bit has a sense of immunity just due to our dislocation, I guess, from from that region. And yeah. well, on that note, I'm really sorry to have to close down the discussion, but we've got another class that needs to come in here for the lecture too. Tom, thank you so much for your time and the the, the range of the global examples that you have to us. While the outlook might be bleak, I was very pleased to see that you also offered some solutions for what we all need to do together. Um, so on behalf of the Caldwell Centre, um, thank you so much for coming.